we find ourselves in La Guelta de Areco, about a two-hour drive west of Buenos Aires, in the peaceful and expansive Pampas, which are the heartland of Argentinian gaucho or cowboy culture. Our gracious hosts, Alberto and Lizzie Rizzo, also host Brother David Stendel Rost in this beautiful estanza. Nowadays, he actually spends a lot of time here. Nikos and I are honored and privileged to have some quality time with Brother David. We met him about 20 years ago, have read almost all of his books, and have listened to many of his interviews and lectures. But we still have some unanswered questions, which we will be discussing today. So here we are in this inspiring place, ready to engage in a lively discussion with Brother David. Also, since Nikos is the more philosophically inclined of the both of us, he will be leading the discussion. And last, most of you already know about the extraordinary life of Brother David. And if you don't, we encourage you to go to grateful.org to learn more. Nikos, over to you. Thank you for the nice intro, Jane. You said it so nicely. I just wanted to add uh, a few things. Uh, Brother David is almost 97 years old, but he's still very productive. Uh, he wrote a book uh, two years ago. He published the book and he's still writing and working full time uh, as if he's uh, in his uh, 20s. And I have the feeling, Brother David, that you have a secret competition with your namesake, David Attenborough, who is uh, actually two months older than you and who is also still producing uh, documentaries uh, for television. I is that so? <laughs> I, I listen to him and, sh and to his programs and enjoy them very yeah. much. Yes, do, yeah. do you I'm feel connected with him? him? But there's no competition. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, it's incredible that at this age, you are still so creative. It's like uh, uh, you are a model for us. Huh? It's a great gift to be able to do it. Yes, yes. And it's a great gift for me to have you visit here, the two of you, and to have this interview with you uh, after so many fr years of our friendship and seeing one another yes. off and on in the United States and in Europe and here in yes. South America. We follow you wherever you go. <laughs> so uh, let us go right in then. Uh, in your most recent book um, and very original book, inspired by the attributes of Allah in the Quran, titled 99 Names of God, you talk about the various qualities of God as you see them through your own Christian understanding and through your own experience of God. For example, God the merciful, um, the, the creator, the evolver, the forgiver, and so on. Yet the other day you agreed with me uh, that us humans attempting to understand the divine or speak of God, uh, we are like mosquitoes uh, trying to understand humans and that uh, our ability to comprehend God is completely beyond us. So uh, we are completely off the mark whenever we try to utter anything. Um, so let me ask you then, how can the Quran or the Bible of you or you be talking about God with any certainty or confidence? <laughs> Your comparison with a mosquito reminded me we had a, when I was a child, we had a children's book. It was a very famous book, The Bee in, Ma the Bee in Maya, it is called, by Bonzels. And that, in it, there is a, a ladybug, uh, and he's a poet. And uh, the ladybug sits on the finger of the child and then writes a poem and the poem goes something like this one time you discovered me when i had a particularly lucky day 
you are round and long and at your tip you have a bony platter which is pointed. However, at the bottom you are stuck. <laughs> this says about as much about the child than we know about the great mystery that we call God. Yes. Uh, however, we have, uh, there's even a comparison here. The child and the ladybug are both alive. They both have life in them. And this mysterious life force is, uh, is actually what stands behind that concept of God. Uh, life and being itself has a mysterious center, a mysterious inner being, and we live in it, it lives in us, and yet we can have a relation to it. And that is the great mystery, that is why we speak of God. Uh, and cannot help speaking of God, and all the great mystics of all the traditions speak of God, because we are deeply related at our innermost being to this mystery of life, the great mystery. And God is only one name that we give, and that is why it is so refreshing and beautiful to see that in the uh, uh, Quran, in the Quran, or in the in the, in the uh, Muslim tradition, you have a special devotion to ninety-nine names of God, uh, and, and they, they don't say the hundred because you can, you cannot exhaust the names of God, and so they say the hundredth name. Only the camel knows. Ah, I didn't you know, know that. Yeah. When the camel sits, you see the camel sitting and chewing the cards and, and meditating like that with their beautiful eyes. And then they are meditating on the hundredth level. Maybe the camel in the end knows more than us. Yes, but this is a, a, there's a deep tr truth behind it, namely and that all of creation, every, uh, every grasshopper, every rainworm, every cat, every dog, every parrot uh, participates in this great mystery and has its own perspective on it, like we as reflective human beings have. And we, many of us, call it God, but we should never forget that that is only a name. Okay, L let me stay a little bit here. We have these 99 qualities, aspects, attributes, whatever you want, you can call them, that describe God. And uh, let's try to narrow it a bit. Uh, the, the Hindus, uh, the Vedantists the talk about Satchitananda, which is three words. Uh, sad, cheat, and ananda, existence, consciousness, bliss. And uh, St. John says, God is love. Okay? How would you define God in a fewer words than 99? Understand? My personal favorite uh, would be to say that uh, the great mystery, which we call love or God or uh, but whatever other name, my favorite name is you. You. It's the great you to my eye. And Martin Buber and Ferdinand Ebner, uh, the great um, uh, philosophers who have dealt with this question, uh, say that we humans 
can only say I because at our deepest level, we are confronted with this great thou, this great you. Uh, I, and the poet E. Cummings says, I am through you, so I. Yes, that's the title of another of, another of your book. book. <laughs> yes. So I am to you, so I. So what is for me the most important uh, aspect of that great mystery is that not only as St. Paul, quoting a Greek poet, says, in God we live and move and have our being like the fish in water, uh, not only that, but we can have a pers personal relationship to it. And that is the mystic, that is th that deep relationship that every human being has, uh, uh, but we have to discover it and we can cultivate it. And it's, it's the one thing that gives meaning to our life. And this is also in harmony with St. John's God is love because this other you with a capital Y is there to be loved, but also it loves us. Relationship yes. is the essence of love. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, L let us go a little bit deeper while we are at the beginning and you still have a lot of energy. I'll challenge you a little bit. <laughs> uh, I think you like challenges. So in Hinduism, we have the, the concept of impersonal and personal God, the Nirguna and Saguna Brahman, you, you know that. And, but Christians and Muslims concentrate more on the idea of a personal God, the God that we adore, the God to which we pray, maybe because Christ was a person and it's also in the history of Christianity. So most believers, rarely if ever conceive of God in abstract terms. Uh, something that gives a lot of ammunition to Dawkins and co, uh, of more easily attacking the concept of God, the old man in the clouds overseeing humanity. And in Mount Athos, they actually, uh, contrary to Dawkins, boldly claim, forget all abstractions, get out of your mind, God is a person. Is God a person, Brother David? Uh, uh, definitely not. Okay. <laughs> when you say a person, in the way in which we use the term person, you mean somebody who cannot be somebody else. Mm -hmm. That is the whole point. If I'm a person, I cannot be you because you are an other person. God is the great mystery, is not one among others. It's the one, it's everything. Uh, but I think however, they, they, yes, yep. yes. I think they mean that he's a person with a capital P, maybe the you that you said before, to which you can relate as a personal you. That is the point. <laughs> To say that God is a person is a very clumsy and mm -hmm. inadequate way of speaking. But that this great mystery has all the perfection of personhood. Mm -hmm. It must be so. Uh, and for where else did we have been from? You see? Uh, so uh, I once uh, spoke with my Buddhist teacher and I said, and you, uh, you and many other Buddhist teachers speak of the human life as a wave that comes forth from the ocean and goes back into the ocean. And I said, your Western um, listeners feel uncomfortable with this concept because now, as a wave, we have consciousness and relationship and 
a personhood which is uh, something very valuable uh, and we all know that and we all agree that being a person is something valuable uh, and his answer was simply if the ocean didn't have it where would the wave have it from so obviously I am, so you, so I, and I can relate to this ultimate reality as you, as a person, in personal terms. But let's not say uh, God is a person. Because it might be misunderstood for the limited idea Much of person. Much too limited. Yes. Uh, well, the Vedantis, I need to say that the impersonal and the personal are two aspects of, of the one. And actually, the Buddhists also say that nirvana and samsara are one. So we, if the timeless and the time bound in the end are two expressions of, of one reality. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, when you hear me, have moments in which you touch upon this ultimate mystery, this ultimate one, you know that it and you yourself are beyond all contradiction. Okay, great. However, right now we have to be faithful to our situation into which we are put and we have to live with these contrasts and with these okay. contrasts. Very clear, very clear. Okay, let us stay on the subject of God. Why would an infinite being, utterly self-sufficient, emanate, create a universe? Why the creation? Why the emanation? Wouldn't nothingness have been a more natural outcome of of everything? <laughs> I don't like these questions and I don't like these speculations. But uh, St. Thomas Aquinas gave a very good answer to it. Uh, we have already uh, said in our conversation here uh, that love is a good a, a way of speaking about God calling this ultimate mystery, love, is a good way of speaking about it. And uh, St. Thomas Aquinas says, love wants to express itself. Wants, love wants to share itself. Okay. And that is... That, that's a poetic answer. <laughs> it's a poetic answer. Well, let me, let me actually uh, tell you what Sri Aurobindo, how Sri Aurobindo answers this question. He says that in order for an infinity to be a true infinity, it has to include an infinity of finites. And uh, not only that, but an infinity of possibilities. And uh, he goes a bit further, and let me tell you how he says it. Uh, he says that Satchitananda loses itself into that which seems to be its own opposite and self finds itself even amid the terms of that opposite. That is very beautiful. You like and it? It's very, uh, uh, very deep thought. Very deep. I remember you sent me the works of Sri Aurobindo uh, long ago. Uh, and he's, he's a profound thinker and. Um, more than think a mystic, he is a mystic. Uh, uh, but uh, I prefer living with that mystery rather than talking about it. Yes. Okay. And even the term mystery comes from the Greek, as you know, muerin, that means to close your eyes and close your mouth. Yes, and yes. I interpret this, I know it comes from the mystery cult, but I interpret this for today as meaning uh, you close your eyes so you are not distracted 
from the relationship to this mystery and you close your mouth because anything you say is wrong. And this is actually an axiom of Christian theology that anything you say about God in theology is more wrong than it is true. Yes. Even if it's true. Yeah. But it, I think it's an interesting idea that uh, in order to have an infinity, you need to have an infinite num number of finites, I think. It makes sense yeah. to our little yeah, well, finite well, rationality. Knowing. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, I think at this point we can bring in uh, Buddhism. Uh, you studied and uh, practiced Zen with Buddhist masters in the 1960s. <laughs> I was uh, a baby then <laughs> when you were doing all these things. And uh, in Buddhism, it's uh, Buddhism is the exact opposite we could say of Mount Athos. They they don't believe in any god, neither a personal nor the concept of God. That's my understanding. Yet it has temples, rituals, uh, holy men, and um, um, all these things that make it look like a religion. Would you say that Buddhism is a religion, or is it a philosophy of life? like in Stoicism or Taoism, how would you, how do you view Buddhism? I would not like to speak about Buddhism. First of all, there are so many different Buddhisms, and especially with regard to this question, many different answers, but I would like to talk about Buddhists, our sisters and brothers who happen to live in the Buddhist tradition. And they, like us, are confronted with the three great existential questions. Why, what, and how? And the, each of these questions, if we follow it, leads us into the depth of mystery, leads us into the depth of, the, of that which we cannot intellectually grasp, but which we can understand. Great difference between grasping and understanding. We can understand it if we allow it to grasp us. And Buddhists, the whole Buddhist tradition, puts the emphasis on the why and lets itself down into this why that ends up in an ocean of silence. Hmm. And the Western traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, focus on the what question. Hmm. What is this, and what is this, and what is this? It also leads into the mystery, but ultimately the answer to what is this, it could be put in these terms, you could say, whatever you ask about, what is this, what is this, anything, any person, any animal, plant, event, is a word that comes out of the silence. So again, it's ultimately mystery. And uh, Hinduism focuses on the question, how? Hmm. And that leads to understanding, mm -hmm. because you understand when you listen so deeply to the word that it takes hold of you and leads you back into that 
depths of silence out of which it comes, and then you understand, and it leads you back. So this, there is a movement, a mystery is, so to say, in motion and comes out of silence into the world and through the world goes back, through understanding, goes back into silence. Mm. And in the Christian tradition, this is expressed to what the early fathers of uh, Cappadocia called the round dance of the Trinity. Mm. And the word, the Logos, is the Corypheus, the leader in the dance that comes out of the silence and through the spirit of understanding leads back to the silence of the Father. It's a beautiful concept and we are invited to participate in it. We are participating in it, but we are invited to wake up to what it's all about. That great dance, that mm. is what it's all about. The great dance. Okay, that's the that's perfect way to finish this chapter and change the uh, subject. And uh, I would like to ask you now some more personal questions. Let me start with a ridiculous question. Do you ever have any doubts that about the nature of your beliefs or the interpretation of your spiritual experiences? Do you ever think maybe I got it all wrong from the very beginning? Uh, because I have a few atheist friends who would have liked to ask you, what if your experiences of the divine are just your mind making you believe this? What if uh, uh, this is just mind games and hormones secreted in your brain? Uh, I definitely Dawkins would and uh, Humphreys would uh, uh, say that. Uh, what if you are uh, experiencing something like people who take psychedelic drugs? How can you have the certainty that your spiritual experiences and knowledge represent something real with a capital R? You ask me if I sometimes have these doubts. I have them all the time. Oh, come on. <laughs> because trust and Faith is not believing something. Faith is trust in life, ultimately, uh, in the ultimate mystery. And trust is not something static. Trust is something that has to be renewed every second. Every moment has to be renewed. And so every moment I am overcoming the doubt. Uh, I live with doubt. Doubt is uh, like and, uh, 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 the wings that you create when you run very fast or go on a bicycle very fast. The faster you get, go, the more uh, wind you create against you. And the more you trust and the more deeply you trust, the more doubt comes against you. Really? That's our experience. Eh? So, I mean, you even doubt the fundamentals of your belief, or just uh, uh, things here and there. If it's fundamental trust, and that's what it must be, it must be fundamental doubt. Oh, come on, you really? Do these doubts lead you into some form of depression sometimes? Because when I have doubts, I'm depressed, you know? You know? I, I'm, I'm I have stress. stress. Yes, I have suffered from depression. Fortunately, short periods, not very long, relatively. Uh, and obviously that's connected. But uh, I have been privileged to practice as a monk a life of faith. That means a life of trust. And so um, I'm, so to say, in training. And uh, it's a great gift of life that uh, 
the times when I'm overcome with uh, doubt are not very many. Mm. But, but I know it's uh, hell. So from a practical perspective, when you have these doubts, is it a daily practice that you ask yourself to retrust in your faith? I, it's not an intellectual thing. It's a matter of the heart. And it's a matter of the whole body. For instance, I have uh, a, as the result of a um, operation that I had in my sinuses long ago, a very uh, difficult situation where I have uh, fear of uh, suffocating. Hmm. And this fear of suffocating is very similar to doubting life. <laughs> because life is breath. Hmm. And if you can't breathe, so I pray and there's moments when I can't breathe. Uh, let every free breath praise you. Right. Yeah. Uh, and okay. every difficult one teach me to trust more. Beautiful. Yes. So you had a wonderful conversation with Tani Simon of South True for your 90th birthday. Uh, seven years ago, and she boldly asked you about your own death, and I loved your response. And Jane, uh, you read better. Can you please of course. Uh, repeat that response? Yes. It's, it's an amazing response, and then I will ask you something about it. So Tammy asks Brother David, I'm curious how you are contemplating your own death. What comes up for you in the face of death? And you replied... Well, the key term in this context is double realm. The poet Rilke used that and coined that term in German, the double realm, the Doppelbereich. When I think about death, the most important aspect is this double realm in which right now we live. Double realm means not two realms put together, but one realm that is at the same time one thing and the other. What I mean specifically is that we live in time and we live in now. Those are two completely different realities. Time, our body lives in time, and time runs out. When my time runs out, then I die. That's how I define death, when time is up. And then you say, that the now contains time and you continued. When time is up, what remains for me is my now that isn't even affected by dying. I live both in time and now, or you can call it eternity. I don't mean by eternity now a long, long time, but the very opposite of time, the now. Uh, what a beautiful uh, answer, Brother David. Uh, but does what you said then mean that whatever we experience here in time vanishes? Or is it somehow absorbed in the now? And, and if so, does it alter or modify the now? Or all is lost of whatever we did in time after our death? Well, the poet uh, T.S. Eliot in his poem, The Four Quartets, has this wonderful line, all is, is always now. All is always now. And that is uh, true on so many different levels. If it isn't now, it is not, because it was or will be, but if it is, it's now. But also, 
the now as eternity, because eternity is defined again by Thomas Aquinas as the now that doesn't pass away. And eternity contains every moment that ever was or ever will be. Eternity contains time. So when you are fully in eternity, because time is up for you, and then you have all the time p present. Uh, connected with that is Rilke's image that uh, he says, angels go through this double realm of living and dead and sometimes do not even know whether they are dealing now with the living or with those who have already died. And the older I get, the more of my friends die. Practically every week somebody dies. I get news of them die. And I have come to uh, make not too much difference. I send loving thoughts to them uh, while they are living, and I'm with them in heart contact, as I call it. Uh, and when I get news that they have died, I continue, and I don't know exactly where they are now, but the co hard conduct can continue. Okay. Uh, you know this passage of Rilke, I learned it from you, about the honeycomb of the invisible. And I can understand that <clears throat> with Beethoven, he created something, and uh, he added it to the honeycomb of the invisible, you know, his fifth and ninth symphonies, and great artists, and uh, great... Uh, literary figures and engineers and physicists, when they create something, in a sense, it remains eternal, yeah? But what about the ordinary lives of people? When, when we die, everything that they did vanishes in, and, and this, is, this brings us to the subject of reincarnation, you know? In Hindu, they have the concept of jiva, that something from this, little personal p with a small p survives and uh, comes in some communion with the big p even after death not all is lost what is your view of reincarnation and this um, continuing of uh, life of the personal element that has traversed a path in time uh, actually surviving death. Well, you are, may, f f there are many la layers to this question. Okay, yes. But the, the main point is what really matters when you die, what matters of the life that you have had. And you spoke about the big, uh, about Beethoven's symphonies and, and Picasso. <laughs> Picasso, whoever, the, the great achievements. I have a feeling that what really matters on Beethoven's deathbed and then Picasso's deathbed is not uh, the Ninth Symphony or Guernica, but a f smile that they gave to someone where they didn't really feel like smiling. <laughs> that is what really matters in life. The, the little deeds of love, that is what really matters. The other things are beautiful and good, but... And every human being is full of this nectar of goodness next to all the other things. And that is to be harvested, as Rilke puts it, in the great golden honeycombs of the invisible. Mm. But then there's another level to your question, and that is reincarnation. Uh, uh, 
I personally think of reincarnation, the whole doctrine of reincarnation, as one of the many attempts that human beings have made in the course of history to explain what happens if you die and you are not fully uh, matured to f enter into the embrace of the one. It is a beautiful, poetic expression, but to me, no more than that. And people who think they can remember their uh, previous incarnations, there are some really remarkable, uh, there are some remarkable evidence, I wouldn't call it evidence, but some remarkable episodes, whole books for, very remarkable, I must say, very remarkable. But to my mind, to explain them by the fact that you, whatever that means in you, were once this Egyptian princess is a much too complicated explanation. Uh, it's not necessary. Everything hangs together with everything. We know of our uh, communal memory. Jung has explored it. Uh, and we have, uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't ex accept that we have memories of uh, the collective unconscious. Collective, we participate in this collective memory, and I would say it probably goes even much further back than our human existence, and the pre-human um, uh, animals, and that's all in us. Uh, if uh, one time, for instance, I had an interesting experience. Uh, it was after the war, and in Austria, we had this innate aversion to the Germans. Uh, and it was a student's meeting, and a German student started speaking with a heavy Prussian accent. And before I heard what she was saying, I felt the hair stand up on my back, just like a dog's hair stands up when the dog sees a cat. That was such an important experience to me. It taught me so much about myself. And I believe that uh, this, connectedness with animals and even plants uh, has ways of explaining uh, what we explain through stories of I was this once and now I'm this. Th I personally think so. But I would not ruin anybody if they, they find this very helpful. I always say in the Catholic tradition we have uh, um, another way of si explaining what happens to us when we die and are not ready to really enter this union with God, and we call it purgatory. And there have been people in the past uh, who were thinking about fire and, uh, and heat and how long will it burn and how hot will it be. We don't do that anymore. So why should we be so literal when it comes to a poetic, beautiful poetic answer given through incarnation? So it's still a mystery, a big mystery for you too. 
You would, yeah, yes. We yes. don't know. We don't. So now we'll go to the last uh, section. I'll be asking you a few things about the, the future of the world and how you view it. Brother David, you did not only read Zweig's book, uh, The World of Yesterday, but you actually lived through that period between the two world wars. And it's an amazing coincidence that you uh, both ended up uh, loving this place, uh, this part of the world, uh, South America, and uh, he moved here also uh, uh, after the second, uh, during the Second World War, and you have moved here. He moved in Brazil and you moved here. He was also from Vienna, like you. And, uh, uh, but I think neither you nor he could ever have imagined that after uh, World War II, uh, these nations of Europe that went through centuries of wars and uh, catastrophes, uh, that they would come together and create this beautiful entity called the European Union that has managed un until last year, at least for 77 years, to, have a, to keep peace in Europe. Uh, we don't have any borders anymore. We can move around in Europe and work whenever we like. And Europeans really feel European. Do you see this model of the EU, which has been so successful and so beautiful, you know, countries without borders, uh, expanding to South America, Asia, and Africa, groups of nations coming together to create similar confederations? Do you see that as being a possibility in the future? Uh, I will answer the question. But I have difficulties with the word seeing. Uh, I don't know from whom this quotation is, but some wit said, uh, predictions are always difficult, especially if they concern the future. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to make any predictions. I'm not seeing anything, but I would have a great, great hope that this model would also be uh, spread in other parts of the world. And I would wish that it would be lived in Europe. And we must see if it is tried in other places, uh, we must not make the same mistake that we made in Europe, where all the emphasis fell on the economic and nothing on the cultural and celebratory. Uh, we, uh, we ought to celebrate it together. From the beginning, we ought to have had every year or every few years a festival of Europe, of the United Europe, with all the variety and the unity displayed. Alberto the other day told me that you have a vision for the future that we would be living in small uh, communities. Is that something you would like to happen or is it something you see happening? Again, <laughs> predictions are <laughs> difficult, especially if they concern yes, the future. But you would like it. But I would like it and... Uh, <clears throat> what exactly do you mean? The, yeah. And the power pyramid has been the model for civilization uh, for about 6,000 years now. Uh, and this power pyramid consists in the ones on top being, it's a pyramid of fear. Our whole civilization is built on fear. The ones on the top fear that somebody else will get on top. The ones a little further down fear that somebody else will get ahead of them. So I, the ones on top use violence to keep in place. The ones further down keep use violence in competition. The ones on the bottom fear that there is not enough for everybody. Everybody fears that. So there is violence in greed uh, and uh, possessiveness. 
uh, all this violence out of fear has led us to a point where it is self-destructive. We are standing at the brink of self-destruction, not only as a civilization, but also nature, we are exploiting nature and uh, we are in a very, everybody knows we are in a very precarious situation. Uh, the opposite model is a network of networks, and that is in, in the way nature works. And as the great uh, teacher, of phys uh, physicist Fritjof Capra shows, uh, we need to model our culture on nature. And networking is one of the most important aspects. And uh, fortunately, as I see around, I see that within that power pyramid, there are already many, many small networks uh, growing up and networking with one another. So that is where I place my hope. Hey. Good. Well, we uh, came to the last question, we started with God and religion, and uh, now we are discussing about the future. So let's combine the two, the future of religion. I will tell you what Vivekananda said, who was against many rituals and dogmas and organized religions. He envisioned a world where every person, through his education and personal experiences, would create and represent his or her own personal religion. He said that in the future, we would have as many religions on the planet as humans, no organized religions. What do you think of this idea? Well, uh, there is something to be said for it, and there is some very serious a uh, uh, question about it. First, the positive. We live in a time of tremendous transition, and one of the uh, not so clearly noticed transitions is that um, something is happening to authority. Uh, Authority is being interiorized. External authority is being replaced by inner authority. Uh, it is comparable to a period in the uh, biological evolution when there existed, or existed only an external skeleton like lobsters have, or bugs. Uh, and then it was replaced, replaced by the vertebrae coming about, who have an inner uh, skeleton which freed them to, uh, in their mo mobility enormously. It was a tremendous step forward. And something very similar is happening today it seems to me that formerly uh, people's life, lives were held together and their opinions and everything was held together through external pressure from external authority. Now, an inner liberation has taken place and people uh, stand on their own two feet, so to say. Uh, so this speaks for individualization of everything, also religion. What's difficult in this image is that religion implies community. Mm. Religion has to do with relationship, uh, religiousness, not just this or that religion. But being spiritual has to do with cultivating your relationships. And so this idea 
of my own private religion unrelated to any other makes no sense. I think he, he meant more the idea that everybody would have his own personal experience that would inform the beliefs. I think that's what he and meant. And that I should certainly do believe. Uh, 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 our, uh, we will always have religion, religions, because human beings are from by nature, our psyche is by nature directed towards those great existential questions. We are directed towards mystery. That is what makes us human. So this religiousness will always need to express itself in cultural forms. And a religion, this or that religion, is the expression of human religiousness in the forms of a particular culture at a particular time. So this will always be the case. Uh, but within this religion, each one will have to, that is the goal even of every religion, to uh, help its faithful to have a personal relationship to this great mystery. And that means a mystic a relationship. So the future of religion will be that it is a community of mystics. Okay. And the great Catholic theologian, Karl Rahner, and the great theologian of the 20th century said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or he will be nothing. Mm. So that goes That's very, very similar. Much. Yeah, it's identical. Same, same. I think actually this is what we can end up with in the, in the, in the first place. So in that yeah. case, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Brother David, for thank bearing you. us. <laughs> thank you for your good questions and for your wonderful preparation for our conversation. Okay. And thanks to our team for filming it. And yes, we have three girls here, two camera women and uh, one uh, sound engineer. Uh, Many it's thanks incredible. To we managed to uh, put it together in a few days because it was very spontaneous what we did and extemporaneous, you know? Uh, yeah. And <laughs> thanks to life for giving us this wonderful opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.